Good morning. Good morning. Y'all are getting better at that. I can tell you you've done so good. Good to see you this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here on this rainy day and being a part of this day. I hope as we gather together, God will minister to your heart and to your soul that you may be driven and enlivened to serve him in this world. We want to welcome everybody who is here today. We want to welcome those who are joining with us this morning through the the various forms of media. We are glad to have you with us. We'd love to have you with us, and we hope maybe someday you can be with us. But again, it is it's a blessing to be here. I do have an, one uh, announcement that I need to, to make. I understand that uh, Mr. Dwayne Wells' visitation is tonight at the Old Path Baptist Church, so if you want to make it to visitation, you can go by there and, and be, meet with the family and see the family. I also want to tell you that I spoke with uh, Linda's the, the crew, I should say, in Nashville, and Linda's doing good. In fact, she said, uh, the word was, she had a wonderful day yesterday. But she has received her chemo, and she is um, uh, a little bit sick this morning. Not real bad, but getting there. And, of course, it's going to progress, and we want to keep her in our prayers. And if Linda gets a chance to connect to the Internet, she can see this worship service and hear us talking about her. And so we want to take care of her and pray for her. We want to pray for all of those who are on our prayer list. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for being a part of this day. It is a glorious time when we can gather together as one people to worship and love our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Steve. We're going to get back into our worship service and song this morning. Our hymn now is hymn number nine, Glorify Thy Name. Let's all stand as we sing. We're in the celebration hymnal this morning, by the way. Celebration hymnal this morning. Hymn number nine. standing for affirmation of faith this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, 
whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 624. His eye is on the sparrow. 624. going to say something about uh, Maya and Isaiah. Of course, you know, uh, Mike and Stacy's uh, kiddos back there. And of course, you know, Maya's definitely the uh, prettiest one of the bunch. Isaiah, I'm sorry. But uh, Maya, can I brag on your brother just a little bit? Of course, Maya's uh, big time involved in the band and she does a great job on that. And you'd be proud of her if you don't get a chance to uh, see her uh, marching out on the field for the Red Bay Band. But I want to brag on Isaiah. Isaiah, I don't know where you know this, but you need to know it. He's uh, an exceptional golfer, and he's uh, got a scholarship at Meridian Community Colleges, which is one of the top uh, junior colleges in the United States as far as golf is concerned. 
and uh, he's had an opportunity to move it to the next level when he leaves Meridian, and he is signed officially to be a golfer for the University of Memphis, and he is rated the number one JUCO junior college golfer. You know how they rank them and stuff? He's got the top rank of any golfer in the country in the junior college ranks, and we're talking about lots and lots of them. And I'm proud that I know Isaiah Jackson, aren't y'all? Y'all give mine, Isaiah, a big hand. Congratulations. At this time, if our youngsters will come on up to the front, Miss Shelley's got us a great message this morning. Y'all come on down at this time. By the way, if you're 25 and below, you're coming on down. Did you know that it's okay to feel angry? It's what we do with our anger that makes the difference. What are some things that make you angry? People. Abby? Fake people, right? Yeah. Well, people like your sister. What else makes you angry? Bad grades. Not being able to do what you want to do. What? Failing at a game. Well, you know what my all-time worst thing that makes me angry is? It's when people pull out in the road in front of me and then they go 20 miles an hour down the road. I'm like, if you're not going to go any faster than that, why are you in such a hurry to pull out? And that makes me really angry. <sighs> but do I say ugly words? No. Now, Mary Lila saw this this morning, and she asked if it was for her. Would you open this for us? You want to open it? No. <laughs> you really don't. Uh-uh. You have to go outside if you're going to open it. A lot of things can make us angry, but it's what we do with our anger that makes a difference. Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That means when we get angry, we have to talk about it, not yell about it, talk about it, or listen to quiet music, or go for a walk, or something so that it doesn't make us explode and do something we'll be sorry for. Because what would happen, Will, if we took the lid off? Huh? It would explode. And I have seen tempers explode before, and it's not pretty. Next time you get angry, you need to find something you can do so you don't explode. Joe and Jay. Let us pray. Dear God, we need your help when we're angry. Help us learn good things to do to keep our anger from exploding and not do harmful things. Thank you that you've given us a Bible that it's so full of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.
Thank you, Ms. Shelley. At this time, if our ushers will come, we'll receive this morning's regular offering, and that'll be followed by our building fund offering. I want to ask you to remain standing. We're going to do 548. It's called the deer, and of course after that uh, we'll have our message this morning from Brother Steve. Once again, it's hymn number 548.
If you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading, I'll be reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark 10, 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. Mary Hollingsworth, in her book entitled Fireside Stories, tells a a wonderful story about a devoted follower of Christ in Romania named Richard Wormbrand. Wormbrand was arrested by the communist many years before for believing in Jesus. For 14 years, he and some other Christians were kept in a little room some 30 feet below a building somewhere in the ground. It was a horrible life for them, to say the least. When he was finally released, Richard wrote a book entitled Tortured for Christ to relate to the world what he had gone through for his faith. He began traveling and and telling his story. But as a result of of his torture and his imprisonment, there was a bit of a problem for, for Richard because Richard could no longer stand up to speak. His feet were so damaged by the torture he had endured that he would have to sit and speak wherever he went. After the wall came down in 1992, Rumbrand uh, was able to go back to to his home country, to Romania. While he was there, they, they took him to show him the very first Christian bookstore ever to be built in the nation. They were giving him a tour of, of the place and showing him the books. Then the owner said, Richard, come downstairs. I I want you to see this wonderful thing, this warehouse we have for all of our books in the basement. So Richard and his elderly wife went down the stairs, and when they got to the room, Richard was shocked by what he saw. In fact, everyone was shocked, for Richard began to stand up, and, and he danced across the floor with his battered and strained feet. Richard, what has gotten into you, asked the owner of the store. Wormbrand began to laugh, and he said, This is the room. This is the very room they kept me in for 14 years of my life. That is a powerful but true story of how one man's imprisonment is transformed into a story of liberation and triumph through the power of his faith. It's a powerful story of of how darkness and despair can be transformed into light and joy. All of it made possible by the power and the hand of a God who does that kind of work. That's one of the things about the God we serve, the Christ we worship. He has a way of setting the captive. Our passage this morning is about Bartimaeus. Now, many are familiar with this story. In this story, Jesus does what Jesus seems to do so well. He, he heals and he helps others. 
Now, there's a, there is a tremendous amount worth discussing here in this passage, but one sermon could not possibly touch it all. Bartimaeus was called the son of Timaeus. In some translations, that means the son of uncleanliness or uncleanness. In those days, there was often prejudice associated with human suffering, often a cruel view of how God worked in the lives of his children. Now that alone is a sermon by itself, and someday I'll be glad to touch on it, but today I, I want to talk about this man. I, I want to talk to you about Bartimaeus. While the scriptures tell us Bartimaeus was born blind, it may very well be true that Bartimaeus could see more than anyone knew that he could see. Imagine what it must have been like to be blind in Jesus' day. It certainly isn't easy now, but it was much harder then. Back then, it was a terrible struggle to manage. No one had seeing eye dogs trained to help you move through the streets of, of Jericho. I doubt that there was any effort to provide any type of handicap accessible streets, crosswalks, or, or even bathrooms. For Bartimaeus, there was no state office of vocational rehabilitation or the Federation for the Blind. The blind lived hard and difficult lives. They spent their days living and begging in the streets. A blind man couldn't work. A blind man couldn't go to the field. A blind man could not provide for a trade. There was no braille or taped words for him to use. There was nothing. To be blind meant your whole life depended on others. So he was forced to beg for food money. He had to trust that, that someone would help him. He had to trust that once he had the money that someone would help him buy the things that he needed to help him keep track of whatever money he had. He had to rely on, on someone to take him to his post every day, and then he had to rely on someone else to take him back from his post to home every day. Bartimaeus was a prisoner to his blindness. His life was lived in darkness. Not just the darkness that comes from being blind, but the darkness that consumes a life when there's little hope that anything's going to be better in your life. That in itself, is its own tragedy. It's a horrible place to be. A place where there seems to be no way out. A place where you can only hope that someone will help you get through the next day. I have seen people there before. I have known and I know people who believe that there's little hope in the future that anything can change. And until we have been there, it is impossible to understand how debilitating that is. Yes, I have, I have seen it. I've seen it in a few adults. I've seen it in dozens upon dozens of children. It's an unpleasant thing to witness and watch. Yes, Bartimaeus' life was hard. You need to see that and you need to understand that in, in this particular story. How would you feel? How would you feel if all you could ever hope for was for the mercy of others to take care of you and a, and a few pennies a day? Or a name that declared to everyone who knew you that you were not born clean? Yes, things were hard for this blind beggar. Yet there was hope. There was one hope that remained, one opportunity for him, one place, one person who he could still turn to for help. On this particular day, Jesus and, and the disciples were, were on their way to their Passover, and, and their journey took them through the, the city of Jericho. Bartimaeus must have heard of Jesus, and he must have heard of his teachings, and certainly he must have heard of his healing power. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by, the scriptures tell us he began to, to call out to the Lord. For that, for that moment, for that moment at least, there was a possibility, there was a hope that, that welled up inside of him. 
Jesus, son of David, he said, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouted. Now some wanted Bartimaeus to keep his place. Be quiet, Bartimaeus. But Bartimaeus would not be quiet. His best hope, maybe his only opportunity was, was passing before him. His way out was, was coming close to him. He couldn't see him, but Lord, he sure could call to him. So he called even louder and louder. It didn't matter what anyone else said to him. He had to be heard. Can't you hear him just screaming, Lord, please, please help me where I am. The good news is, Jesus did hear him. Bring him to me, he said. I, I think Jesus knew what Bartimaeus needed, and I think he knew what he wanted. He was more than just another beggar looking for a piece of silver. In the middle of the crowd, in the middle of all the commotion, he heard a plea. He heard a plea of a man who was shouting for mercy. He heard a, a cry that came from the depths of Bartimaeus' soul. Christ heard the plea, and he could not, nor would he, have refused it. What do you want, Bartimaeus, Christ asked. Jesus, I, I want to see. He didn't ask for anything other than, than his sight. He didn't ask to be at the seat of honor like his disciples did just a few lines up in the text. He didn't ask for a donation. He didn't ask to be remembered in the kingdom of God. He just asked to see. All the man wanted, all the man wanted was an opportunity, a chance to start again with sight. With sight, he could, he could start his life all over again. He would be free to support his family, free of, of being associated with uncleanliness, despite his name, free from the stigma that he somehow deserved all of this or that he was just another lazy beggar. I just want to see Jesus. And he trusted that Jesus could make that happen. The scriptures tell us Jesus said to him, Bartimaeus, your faith has made you whole. That is our God. A heart begs for mercy, and our God responds. There is a powerful message in this story. Our God hears our cries. He hears our call for mercy. He hears a call that comes from a desperate or broken heart. He hears it, and because he does, does he, he renews it. He renews us, and he he makes us whole and clean again. There are those who need to hear this story. For I can tell you there are many whose lives are lived as though they are imprisoned in a dark world these days. They've had some bad experiences. Horrible things have taken place in their lives. They, they are blinded to God, that, that they're so blind that they have lost sight of, of him at all. And then there are others who, who have not suffered a lick, who haven't struggled a lick, yet somehow they have become blinded where they think they can't see God either or don't want to see God or God is not relevant. He's not a part of their lives nor a part of their world. But I tell you this, and I say to them, I say to all of them, Jesus is still there. Jesus is still there for just those kinds of people. Just as surely as he is here with us, he is still there with them. He is with them this very moment. What makes us different than them is only one thing and, and one thing only. That somewhere along the way, Sometime, somehow, we, each of us, came to a place in our lives where we called out to the Son of David to have mercy on us, and he heard us, and we knew it. Scriptures say Bartimaeus was healed because of his faith. You see, Bartimaeus knew who Jesus was. 
Well, there's some words in the passages here that, that are really important. Bartimaeus called to Jesus, and he called him uh, the son of David. In those words, in that statement, in that proclamation, he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, I know who you are. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. I know that you have the power to give sight again. I know you have the power to heal. I know that you can make me whole. That's what hopeless folk need. That's what folks need that cannot see their way to God. They need to know that no matter what they have experienced, the Christ we believe in, the Christ we love, can give them a new life. Through Christ, you can always begin again. They need to understand that Jesus is the world's Messiah and that he has the power to change lives, to bring folks out of the darkness, whether their darkness is self-inflicted or horribly thrust upon them. If you can believe as Bartimaeus did, if you can believe Jesus is the Son of the Most High God and that he is worthy of your trust, well, this is what I can say to you. You can and will be born again. You can have a new lease on life. You can be made clean. You can see your way out of the darkness that you are in. Jesus can do wonderful things, you know. He brought a man out of an underground prison cell to preach and teach to others all about God. He even turned this gentleman's cell into a place where the books of others who are writing about Christ and the difference that Christ makes in their lives, he turned his prison cell into a library where others can go and sit and read for themselves about Christ. He gave a blind beggar that others had told to hush a new life and a new beginning and a reason, as the scriptures say, to follow him. the church these words are important there are many who are blind all around us they are crippled by the things in this life or by the lure of this world and yet this is the truth their best hope is us it will always be us. Wormbrand suffered mightily for his faith, yet he never surrendered that others could find their way out of the darkness and into the light of God's grace. Wormbrand penned these words. I want you to listen to these words. He penned these words even for those who saw no value in him while he was in prison. I have learned to look at men not as they are, but as they will be. In my persecutors, I could see a future Apostle Paul or even a jailer in Philippi who may one day become a convert to Christ. You should always remember this. Carry this with you always. Our God makes the blind to see and the crippled able to dance. No matter who or what they were, Before. A closing. If you'll please turn in your hymnal to page 571 for trust and obey, we'll sing the first and fifth verse. 571.